Good morning to those joining us in the United States and the Americas, and good afternoon to those joining us from across the Atlantic. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President at the Atlantic Council. I have the pleasure today of introducing this important conversation, a fireside chat on the European Democracy Action Plan. This conversation is hosted as part of 360 STRATCOM, the Atlantic Council Digital Forensic Research Lab's premier government forum that brings together allies and partners to discuss how we can better work together to mitigate the threats to democratic institutions in the digital age. For today's conversation, I'm particularly honored to introduce the European Commission Vice President for Values and Transparency, Viera Jourova. Uh, Vice President Jourova has championed efforts across Europe to create common standards to regulate tech and social media platforms. She previously served as Commissioner for Justice and Consumers and Gender Equality. And prior to joining the Commission, she was a Minister for Regional Development in the Czech Republic. But in her current role, she has among the most important tax, tasks, and I must say, among the greatest titles out there. We're so delighted to welcome you back to our stage, Madam Vice President. Thank you for being with us. And we are also delighted to welcome Maricha Schachte, who will moderate the conversation. Mrs. Schake is a Dutch politician, a former member of the European Parliament, and the founder of the Parliament's Intergroup on the Digital Agenda for Europe. She serves as the International Policy Director of the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford University. Uh, but Maricha is also an ardent Atlanticist, a passionate advocate for privacy, an innovative mind, and a good friend of the Council. So last Thursday, the European Commission presented its long-awaited European Democracy Action Plan which is designed to defend democratic institutions in the European Union with a focus on countering disinformation and protecting media and election integrity in member states. Today, Vice President Jorova and Mr. Schake will guide us through the plan's development, its main points, and highlight what the plan is intended to achieve and what it means for European democracy and for a global regulatory framework. At the end of today's sessions, we're going to be taking questions from all of you that have joined in the audience. So for those of you who have joined us on Zoom, please go ahead and use the built-in Q&A function and submit your questions. And for everyone else, please tweet uh, your questions and stay engaged in the conversation using the hashtag 360STRATCOM. And with that, over to you, Mariche. Thank you so much, Damon. It's really nice to see everybody. I'm very, very happy to uh, welcome Vice President Yarova to the important discussion on the democracy action plan which uh, has been a long time coming between you know the the growing role and power of technology companies and their impact on democracy unfortunately also harmful uh, and what the best eu response could be so i would like to start uh, by asking what the real process and the goal behind creating this democracy action plan was uh, what the big aims are and how it ended up uh, where we are, were there any behind the scenes uh, experiences you can share or uh, was it all a smooth process that got us to this point of, of presenting the plan? Thank you very much. Uh, I am also happy to be here with you and good morning to US and good afternoon to Europe. Uh, well, in fact, uh, Mariche, we are uh, reflecting on what you wrote uh, in Financial Times, I think, two years ago. <laughs> that we have to take action to protect democracy and, and uh, also protect the values. So here we are, uh, the European Democracy Action Plan, and I, I will use the acronym to make it shorter, if you, if you uh, allow me to do that. It was not, not an easy, easy thing to do, many hot issues. Uh, uh, who dares to regulate on democracy? <laughs> who dares to define what is the truth, what is the lie? Who dares to define what is political content, what's not political content? All these issues we had on our table uh, to resolve and somehow to uh, uh, present the, the possible solutions in this ADAP. Uh, ADAP, which is not ideological. This is not left wing or right wing. This is just the plan how to uh, protect and nurture democracy, how to efficiently uh, uh, counter disinformation, how to support media. Uh, and uh, this is the core, core uh, content of, of ADAP. Why uh, we had to do that? Well, uh, maybe 10 years ago, many people would be surprised why we are coming with such a plan. 
and now it's quite obvious because what we see is rise of extremism uh, especially online uh, we see a lack of transparency and accountability of online platforms we see insufficient application of rules relevant for elections in the digital world or sometimes lack of any rules last year before european elections uh, I asked the member states to cooperate on protecting the European elections against new uh, emerging threats. And to my big surprise, uh, in more than half of the member states, there is no legislation reflecting the fact that the political marketing has shifted from offline to online. Yeah? So, so this is where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen interference in our democratic processes and of course uh, coming back to the situation of media media and safety of journalists is deteriorating so uh, a lot of things uh, and uh, emerging threats to uh, to push us to take action democracy is not a perpetuum mobile this is not the end of the history something which is not automatic and we definitely have to, to take action. And the plan is the real plan. It is not one-off uh, action. So we are foreseeing some legislation next year for the political marketing online, uh, for um, uh, the protection of, of journalists against the abusive litigation. We will recommend the member states uh, several things relating to media and to elections. And we will upgrade next year the code of practice against disinformation. Because before the legislation, which is called the uh, Digital Services Act, will come into force, and I guess you will ask about that in a minute. Uh, so before we, we have the legislation in place, fully applicable, we will have to continue the self-regulatory methods through the code of practice against disinformation and code of conduct against hate speech and draw a line between those two things. Because mm -hmm. this information, how we understand it and how we assess it, it's not illegal but harmful content. And we must take some action with, at the same time, protecting the freedom of speech, which is the most difficult thing in, in the whole thing, in the mm -hmm. whole plan. And the second thing to, uh, uh, how to say it, to promote the principle that what is illegal offline must be also recognized as illegal online. And this is another story. This is the hate speech. This is child pornography. This is uh, terrorism online. And here, the Digital Services Act will, will come with a proposal how to increase the responsibility of the platforms not to distribute illegal content. Uh, so this is this is the, the division between those two things and i wanted to stress it at the very beginning of this debate mm -hmm. no thank you i think that's very helpful because for people who don't live in the brussels bubble they see you know a lot of ambitious proposals and, and may wonder how do they interact with each other but i think you've clarified uh, very clearly how the digital services act seeks to look at the oh. tech platforms mostly including uh, how they should deal with illegal content vis-a-vis uh, -vis the code of practice and then also the democracy action plan which focus on on media so um perhaps we can we can also look at how you see uh, the global context uh, there has been a lot of anticipation of the new u.s administration uh, there may be other countries taking initiatives or um, other regional initiatives what do you what do you see as the EU specific role, but also its relation to partners and other initiatives being taken in this field? Uh, well, for me, it has been always interesting to watch what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic, and and you know we had numerous talks with uh, the uh, first the the Mr. Obama's uh, administration, then Mr. Trump Trump's administration, with the Congress, also with the masters of Silicon Valley about uh, the protection of privacy. And I heard many times uh, from America that we are in European Union obsessed about the rules and that uh, GDPR will be the end of innovation and competitiveness of the companies. And it didn't materialize. And now we are coming with something uh, else uh, where the EU has the ambition maybe also to be the inspiration for others because uh, what we plan to do uh, through ADAP but also Digital Services Act is something like uh, setting the rules for the next uh, maybe 20 years and uh, 
if I understand well American realities and the, the US situation uh, and what I hear from US partners there are very similar challenges and very very similar uh, threats and, and risks uh, which stem from from the digital world and uh, so I believe that uh, as soon as possible we should re resume uh, intensive uh, communication with, with our American partners uh, after January next year about whether we can continue doing doing these things together uh, and uh, I, I have big expectations. Uh, one personal reflection uh, when I was first in the US in 2015 and the talks were mainly about the protection of privacy, I, I heard a lot of mentoring and lecturing from different places that uh, the digital content must remain untouched. Yeah, that the first amendment of the constitution says that there are no limits for the content. Mm -hmm. And in the course of time, to my big surprise, I saw the development on American side, which ended up by switching off Mr. President Trump when he was speaking on TV. And uh, this is interesting uh, to watch uh, the development there. Uh, we would not like to switch off anyone unless it is somebody who is committing crime. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the distinction between harmful and uh, illegal. So uh, I appraised Twitter for labeling uh, Mr. President Trump's speech uh, about the correspondence, uh, correspondence uh, way of, of elections. Uh, and for me, uh, adding the facts, it's not a censorship, it's a competition of speeches. Mm -hmm. And it is something which gives the people the free choice, what they want to read and what they want to believe. And ADAP is uh, dealing with this information. Here we face the fact that the people will always have a tendency to believe what they want to believe. Mm -hmm. And we have to let this untouched. So competition of speeches, fact checking, uh, objective uh, news uh, being uh, having a more uh, prominent space online. I think that this is the way now Europe is, is going to go. It wants to go. Yes, well, thank you. No, a lot of what you're saying sounds very familiar in terms of how, you know, Europe's approach to creating an enabling environment to protect democracy. Uh, I, I see in the very background of your uh, your office there uh, a picture of Vaclav Havel. And, you know, I think mm -hmm. in many of, of our countries, the history of fighting for democracy and fighting for the protection of rights, whether it's against abuse of power from government or abuse of yeah. power from corporations is very fresh in memory. And indeed, a lot has changed over the past year in the United States. And hopefully this can lead to closer transatlantic cooperation, also illustrated in the paper uh, that the yeah. European Commission uh, put forward. So I think the momentum might indeed uh, help uh, help with this, this partnership. Another set of partners that you are very keen to engage is actually civil society. Uh, and I'm sure that the Atlantic Council is also interested in, in how that might look. And I'm sure many people online that represent different organizations and people in civil society organizations would be interested too. So maybe you can share a few thoughts on what the role of civil society is from your point of view. Well, of course, uh, by, by ADAP, we want to restore or stabilize a healthy democracy. And it relies a lot on citizen engagement and an active civil society, not only at election times. Uh, when we speak about everything to strengthen, which seeks to strengthen democracy, we, we mainly, as you mentioned, the Brussels bubble, but we have many different bubbles, <laughs> but uh, we are discussing top-down measures and rules, but we have to be always uh, mindful of the fact that the citizens are in the driving seat and active citizens it's something which which we desperately need that's why we want to do everything to enable them to make free choice and uh, their autonomous 
choice, especially in elections, but also between elections. And you mentioned Václav Havel. Yes, I am consulting with him a lot <laughs> in, a, in my job. And I am a living evidence of somebody who uh, lived uh, in a regime uh, which had the only one dictated truth. Uh, and uh, so that's why I'm quite happy with this experience to work on that. But coming back to the people in the driving seat, uh, we want to do everything possible to uh, make sure that all the elections in, in the EU are free and fair, that the people will be able to make a, a well-informed choice. And in between the elections, we believe that the civil society and organizations uh, are, are helping to keep uh, the, the attention uh, to what's happening in the upper floors, yeah, to also uh, keep us who are in power under control and uh, keep us, uh, uh, I don't have the word now, accountable uh, mm -hmm. to, to the public. Uh, we are at the, at the European level, we are doing a lot now also to increase the attention to the European uh, actions. Yesterday we uh, adopted or we agreed on the new rules for increased transparency of the EU institutions so that the people can see who is lobbying for what. Mm -hmm. So I think that this, this, this is a very important step forward. We want to encourage more uh, European citizens uh, uh, initiatives to come on our tables and we simplify the procedures but a lot has to be done on, on member state level and we will have continuous dialogue uh, with, with the member states how to keep uh, vibrant civil society uh, up how to help the, the civil society flourish and this is also something which should stop the trend of narrowing the space for civil society. Mm -hmm. Also by, by means of uh, decreased financing. Uh, the EU will uh, behave in a predictable way. I can promise that. So we will continue the funding through different programs uh, to increase the attention of the people and not to buy their uh, popularity or their <laughs> their mm -hmm. positive opinions. This was never our aim to pay for for uh, for something which would be close to some kind of propaganda. We you know we we just want the people to to have a chance to be more active. Yeah, well, and I think even if you tried, it wouldn't work. I remember well all the many many voices from civil society who made it very <laughs> clear that they were very independently minded, even yeah. if sometimes they received public funding from the EU. So. Um, uh, <laughs> Think that that ecosystem is alive and kicking in the Brussels bubble. Um, I want to now turn to questions from the audience and also invite participants who may be joining us to use the Q&A function on Zoom if they want to add their questions. But um, Willem Hoefnagels asked a lot of questions. I'm going to select one, which is about the role of media and the possibility of, for example, a sample labeling uh, information for quality to counter disinformation by linking local universities to the local press. Uh, apparently there's a start of that going on in uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. And his question is, could such labeling and cooperation between universities and media ensure that there is uh, credible information going to people? It's a very interesting idea of, of uh, not, not labeling it, it, as such, but the uh, linking universities or the research sector with the media. The role of media is, is uh, of course, crucial. Uh, we, we need uh, the professional journalists who can work with the facts to do that and to bring the facts to the light and to make objective assessment of the facts. Uh, we desperately need a cooperation between different actors. And whenever I am asked about how, how we want to fight this information and whether we are not ridiculous that we are not investing hundreds of millions of euros in some, some kind of uh, uh, anti-troll factories. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yes. That we do, uh, uh, many, many crit uh, critics who say that we don't have enough capacities in the commission 
in the external action service, uh, where are the units like Stratcom, Stratcom, and, and, and so on. Uh, and and the, the, the money is known, what we are investing, and how many people are working there. I always say, and I'm coming back to the question, that what's invaluable, what we have and what we are building, is the architecture of cooperation. Yeah, that we have to deploy all the possible positive democratic so, uh, forces and the cooperation of, of professional media with the research, but also with the platforms uh, is essential. Mm -hmm. And here comes the fact that uh, we have very unfa un unfavorable business model now, that the money of advertisers shifted to the big tech platforms. And the uh, media are under horrible financial pressure also due, due to this shift. So we want and we want we will want the digital big, uh, big players to pay for the work of the journalists, be it the fact checking, but also uh, with copyright directive coming into force next June, we mean it that the work of the journalists will have to, to be paid. And I think Mariche, you you were in the parliament uh, during the fight for copyright directive. So mm -hmm. you have, I guess, fresh memories how heavily lobbied this was, and and uh, the, the, all the uh, all those hot moments around that. So the role of media, uh, we we have to guarantee that they have uh, economic conditions to to do their job, and that uh, their work uh, will be uh, duly recognized, uh, and uh, that they their work will be visible, because working the, with the facts. Uh, uh, is uh, is incredibly important. It's interesting when we when we discuss the the foreign influence, especially Russia. I I sometimes uh, try to oh, very often I try to listen to the ad adversaries to understand their way of thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I realize that the Russian doctrine is based on. Uh, uh, the conviction that there are no facts, there is only interpretation. And this is where media have a very important role to say facts are facts, and we are providing them. And the second thing, the people believe, you know, the truth is what the people believe. That's the Russian way of thinking. Yeah, so uh, we we have to understand also this this uh, uh, this uh, method, and uh, we need the media to to work uh, not uh, in in someone's uh, how to say to serve uh, some some kind of propaganda. I I want really the media to serve the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also the pluralism of voices, which I think is so characteristic for how mm -hmm. European media are generally enabled uh, while preserving their editorial independence. Um, I now have a number of questions coming in, so people are no longer shy, which is great. Um, Megan Humphrey asks, how will the European Democracy Action Plan be conveyed via EU assistance to the Western Balkans and Ukraine, which I think also builds nicely on what you said about you know, the, the role that Russia plays, for example, it has a very um, proactive position also vis-a-vis -vis neighboring countries. And so uh, is there anything that the EU can do in this context to support uh, countries like those in the Western Balkans or Ukraine? Both Western Balkans and Ukraine are on board. Uh, and we we are promoting the methods or the, the, the solutions uh, we have in ADAP, but also in, in many other fields. Uh, I personally spoke uh, recently to Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, who uh, a very courageous lady who, who uh, appreciates the possibility to cooperate on, on the fight against this information. For the Western Balkans, uh, we have a specific, uh, this is a specific uh, policy field where, where we also want them to be more resilient and to protect their democracy and democratic institutions uh, from whatever you, angle you, you, you take. So they, they are on, on board and it's, it's not a, a separated world. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. Uh, next question, I'll make a combination between Jean-Francois Boitin's question and Jochai Benavi's question, who point to the question of um, challenges within the EU, which uh, are all uh, on all of our minds, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the rule of law in countries like Poland and Hungary. Um, Jochai asked, while you've talked about the importance of combating hate speech and misinformation in the EU, how does the EDUP uh, proposed to respond to threats to democracy and a free press by member state governments, as we've seen in Hungary and Poland. Hmm. And then I don't, is that... also adds to this question. So three people want to know about uh, Hungary, Poland, sorry, I just got this other question in. Uh, and, and also the question whether Hungary and Poland are able to veto or otherwise hinder uh, the uh, democracy action plan or whether that dynamic is not in play uh, with the democracy action plan vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the budget, which I'm sure some people are, are having on their minds right now. Yeah, this veto is now resonating everywhere, it's true. Uh, yeah. And uh, let's hope uh, we will get out of it soon because everybody needs uh, the money to recover from COVID. Uh, this was the procedural question on ADAP. Uh, I think that we will uh, ask the council, the member states, uh, to uh, to take a uh, decision in the form of the conclusions or uh, it, there is there is nothing like like the moment ahead of us which might veto that i i have to uh, remind us of the fact that uh, edap is not legislation it's a plan which foresees legislation and there uh, if it is not a unanimity file uh, or legislation, we we need to have a majority of the states on on board. So, uh, not not in this case, uh, the, the veto is not uh, uh, foreseen uh, as as the factor which might stop it. Uh, the rule of law in Hungary and Poland, well, do we have uh, several hour, hours ahead of us to explain you <laughs> the situation. Uh, I'm laughing, but uh, it's not uh, a, a nice topic at all. This is a, this is a serious thing and uh, we have several tools. Uh, we, can, we can use them, but uh, again, I will repeat the sentence that the citizens are in the driving seat, even in Poland and Hungary. That's why ADAP is so relevant, because we want the elections in all the member states to be fair and free, that the people can cast their free vote. And this has to be guaranteed everywhere, so uh, ADAP has a relevance there. We also want uh, to achieve, uh, as you said, Mariče, uh, media pluralism. Mm -hmm and conditions for the journalists to do their job. Here we have concerns, in Hungary especially, because uh, what we see, it's, uh, it's uh, the situation that there is no uh, public TV or public radio. We sp speak already about state media. Uh, we see narrowing space for truly independent uh, uh, media because uh, uh, many influential media are uh, 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 under the roof of Kesma, which is the, the merger, which is which is one one entity which is uh, under the protection of the government and vice versa. Yeah, the, so so this is not a healthy situation, and also uh, uh, as for the uh, so after all in in several states uh, when we see the the weakening of media, of the role of independent media and space for media pluralism. We are grateful for having digital tools and social platforms as the demo democratic space for a debate. So uh, you see the complexity of the issue. And we want the debate in digital sphere to be truly democratic and horizontal. Uh, we don't want the people to be chased into the bubbles. Uh, and so that's why also we are looking at how algorithms work and how how the public debate uh, uh, looks like. And I sometimes speak about the, the unhealthy uh, factor of our situation of privatization of public debate, mm -hmm. which is happening mm -hmm. online. And so, uh, so sorry to be that long, but uh, I, I wanted to illustrate that uh, we work on diff many different fronts. 
Oh, don't worry about it. People are here to, to hear what you're working on and, and what you think is important. So uh, please take your time. Uh, there's a, another question by Roland who asked, is there a motivation or maybe already uh, efforts ongoing uh, to implement education plans on disinformation awareness with children and youngsters? Uh, the examples of Estonia and Finland are given here. I'm also myself familiar with the uh, lie detectors program. Uh, is that part of the action plan or is it more uh, up to oh. member states themselves because it's education? These are great examples which have been mentioned. Uh, we uh, have uh, the chapter about, about education in the EDA, but also uh, we recently adopted the European Digital Education Plan where is a lot about the need to increase the, the education and critical thinking and we count with supporting the education in this direction through different financial financial instrument uh, we have including the cohesion policy so it will be up to the member states but at the same time uh, we are continuing the dialogue with the member states uh, trying to convince uh, some of them especially to to in include uh, the education and, and uh, digital education especially under the funding funded priorities because we we believe that this is necessary i sometimes use the the, the comparison of where we are that uh the 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 digital sphere it's like a white uh, highway and uh, heavy trucks on the highway which are damaging the highway, so they, the highway needs to be repaired from time to time. Here comes the idea to, to uh, collect the money through digital tax, mm -hmm. because the trucks also pay the toll. Yeah? So, so, and, and part of the digital tax in the future, if we manage to, to promote that and to, to, to have this uh, uh, digital tax decision, so part of this money should, be, should, should come back to education. Uh, so that the people who drive on the highway have the proper driving license after the proper education <laughs> so it, it's the the example which is maybe a little bit primitive with the with the highway but uh, i see that more money will be needed for education the eu is going to pay and and push uh, for high quality programs but uh, also, also we need to use the money uh, which is raised uh, from digital sphere one day in the future. Yeah, I think we can fill another seminar talking about uh, the, the opportunities and the challenges there, but it's indeed a growing uh, sense of urgency to get good, good answers to the question of taxation and redistribution. Uh, I'm sure it will also be a hot topic in the United States after the impact of the COVID pandemic and the growing uh, bank accounts of the tech companies. Um, I wanted to final, finally ask you one last question, which is a little bit different, and maybe in your analogy it would be the highway. I'm not 100% sure, but um, you focused in the past with, with the code of practice on the role of social media companies. You just mentioned those trucks of the big, uh, big players in that context. Uh, but there's also the question of state-led disinformation. So not only enabled by the algorithms and the business model and uh, the way in which uh, information flows through the commercial arteries of the internet, uh, but also what states are trying to do. What responsibility is foreseen for um, states, governments of the member states to protect their populations from this kind of disinformation, particularly coming from China and Russia, but it could also be coming from elsewhere. I think that, uh, sorry, I will put it down. Uh, I, want, I want to to, to, take, to make one comment. We do not blame the digital companies and digital players for all our failures. The politics and politicians uh, have a lot of own failures in, in the recent uh, decades. So when we see the distrust uh, in, in, the pa in part of our society, well, we have to ask first whether we haven't made mistakes which, which lost the trust of the people. Yeah? So, so I want to mention this, that we are not blaming <laughs> digital for every, everything uh, which is wrong. Uh, what should the, the governments do, uh, and as, as well as the EU, uh, 
well, uh, I will make a little bit ironic, but not so so much comment that our, our first task and foremost, uh, first and foremost, what we, we should not do is to produce this information ourselves. Yeah, so, so this is for us to always uh, come with the information uh, <clears throat> which will be trustworthy, which will be reliable, which will be verifiable. Uh, which uh, we uh, be able to defend, yeah. And this is this is not only about the facts. This is also about the opinions, and opinions belong to all of us. And and this is the responsibility of the pl uh, politicians to defend the facts, but also to come with the opinions which will uh, uh, be. Uh, uh, trustworthy and based on on the facts uh, i don't want to go to go far and here is the role of the people they have to judge whether they believe us or not whether they uh, and and to to enable them to make the free choice not only in the elections yeah so so th this is I, I wanted to to mention also the responsibility of the political sphere with the member states, uh, in relation to foreign influence and foreign uh, uh, pressure, we have created uh, something which we call rapid alert system. And we have a network uh, with all the member states, uh, with, the, with the units dealing with this information and foreign, uh, foreign pressures. Uh, from all the member states, where we are sharing the alerts, sharing information, it was uh, uh, quite intensive because uh, before the European elections last year, and we uh, want to co continue this cooperation. This this networks uh, falls under uh, what I meant by the architecture and cooperation we have in, in the EU against the disinformation. And of course, we do not want in in any member state to create the Ministry of Truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This, this is not our aim. Yeah, so I don't want to be the commissioner of truth. I pro promised it to Václav Havel, who is watching me <laughs> here. But also, this must not happen uh, anywhere in Europe. So uh, responsible uh, work, uh, fact-checking, uh, all those things which I me are mentioned have to, have to be uh, promoted. Well, thank you for that clarification. I'm afraid that leaves us at the end of time. Uh, I know you're very busy and I know that uh, Atlantic Council has a lot uh, going on. So uh, let me, uh, I'm sure this is on behalf of all the participants online, thank you for being available for such an interactive session, uh, for uh, making clear what the EU does aim to do to defend democracy and where it is uh, entirely up to the people, hopefully with access to the most trustworthy information. Uh, best of luck in uh, bringing this forward and all the other work that you're doing towards um, towards values and, and democracy. Very, very important work. Uh, and with that, we'll close this session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.